Good evening, everybody. On behalf of San Mateo County Libraries, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Pro-Con Ballot Measure Forum with the League of Women Voters of North and Central San Mateo County. The library has worked for years with the League of Women Voters, and we very much appreciate their flexibility moving this essential uh, work uh, into a virtual space. Um, I want to also welcome tonight's presenter, Susie Ray. Susie is a member of the League of Women Voters of North and Central San Mateo County and a longtime San Mateo County resident. Uh, Susie, we, we greatly appreciate your time with us tonight. Um, we have- It's a pleasure. Oh, it's a pleasure for us. We, um, we have a lot um, to get through tonight. So there are 12 statewide propositions, we have three local ones, 15 total, um, but we want to also get to your questions. So we've built in some time. Um, we will pause after each proposition and hopefully take two to three questions. Um, I am going to speak the questions to um, Susie um, and hopefully uh, kind of cover um, most of the topics. Um, quick housekeeping note, if you could please um, put your questions in the Q&A. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A um, icon um, on the Zoom toolbar. So go ahead and use that, pop your questions in there. Um, and if we have time at the end, um, we can uh, get to more questions or maybe um, get to some uh, more general topics. Um, I think that's everything um, with, so with that, um, I'm gonna hand it over to Susie. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and, and get my presentation up. Okay, all right, so thank you. Um, hello and welcome. My name is Susie Ray, and I am a member of the League of Women Voters of North and Central San Mateo County. And I'm here tonight to give you an analysis of the 12 ballot propositions of, from the California State Ballot, a tri-county transportation measure, and two local housing measures. So first of all, I'd like to say that this pro and con presentation is part of our mission to encourage informed and active participation in government and to increase understanding of major public policy issues. In doing these programs, the League is nonpartisan. That is, we do not support or oppose candidates or political parties. We may, however, support a policy that is believed to advance democracy through our education and advocacy advocacy efforts. So what is the purpose? There we go. What is the purpose of having ballot measures? The ballot initiative process gives California citizens a way to propose laws and constitutional amendments without the support of the governor or the legislature. Through the initiative process, citizens can either seek to make new laws to modify existing laws or to amend the California state constitution. Voters also have the power to repeal legislation via a veto referendum. The California state legislature may also place measures on the ballot as legislatively referred constitutional amendments or legislatively referred state statutes. Referred amendments require a two third vote in each chamber before it can appear on the ballot. An initiative requires more yes than no votes to pass. On a referendum, more no votes than yes votes are required to repeal a law. Our approach to the analysis of a ballot measure is to describe the current situation or law, then indicate what the proposition will change or do. We then describe the legislative analyst office summary of the fiscal effect on government budgets and taxpayers. Then come the arguments for and against the propositions and who is making them. 
Finally, we look at the financial contributions that support or oppose its passing. We hope you then have enough information to vote yes or no as you are inclined. Here are some things to think about and to consider when deciding which way to vote on a ballot measure. What does the measure seek to accomplish? Do you agree with its goals? Is, it the, is the measure seeking changes that are consistent with your ideas about government? Does the measure deal with one issue that can be easily decided by a yes or no vote? Or is it a complex issue that should be thoroughly examined in the legislative arena? Who are the real sponsors and opponents of the measure? Where is the money coming from? What are the financial or the fiscal implications? Does it earmark, restrict, or obligate government revenues? Is, it, is the measure self-funding? And given the state's budget deficit due to COVID-19, is it a wise way to spend our limited resources? So be wary of distortion tactics and commercials that rely on image but tell you nothing of the substance about the measure. Beware of half-truths. Today, I will discuss a, a number of thematically related propositions. So I'm not gonna be presenting the propositions in numeric order. I'm going to group them by common themes. Um, so we'll pause also for a Q&A, um, particularly after almost every measure, though there are a few that we'll probably talk about together. Um, so be ready to have your questions and we'll go on. Now, before I start, I just wanna take a minute to encourage everyone to vote. And you have lots of ways to cast your ballot. You can return the ballot by mail. You can return your ballot in a drop box around our county. And you can also go to a convenient vote center. And those will be opening up, I believe, in about a week. So I also want to say there are, are lots of other places to get information. The information I'm presenting tonight comes from the League of Women Voters of California. And we have also combined with a group called MapLight to have an online website called votersedge.org. And that's where a lot of the financial information I'll present tonight is coming from. There will also be videos available of all of these ballot propositions. Um, we're recording tonight, but the League of Women Voters of San Mateo County have also produced individual videos that will be available on YouTube in the next couple days. I also wanna mention City of San Mateo had a candidate forum last week. Um, it is also, a, the replay is available on the City of San Mateo website. So let me begin talking about the City of San Mateo, Measure R and Measure Y. These are housing and development issues in the city. So let me start by talking about the way it is in, and the, the bills that have passed previously. In 1991, we enacted Measure H, and this amended the this general plan for future development, and it lowered limits on building heights, residential densities, and non-residential bu building intensity. It also established an inclusionary housing program requiring residential developments to provide at least 10% of the project's units at rents or prices available to affordable, uh, prices affordable to low or moderate income households. This expired in December of 31st of 2005. Then in 2004, Measure P was proposed by the City Council and this extended the expiration to December 31, 2020. In 2017, the California legislature enacted a law that authorizes cities to adopt inclusionary housing ordinances. However, this law requires such ordinances to provide developers of rental housing projects with alternative means of satisfying the inclusion, inclusionary housing requirement. So the general plan in San Mateo currently provides for tiered building height and intensity limits at certain locations in the city. 
Generally, there are lower height and intensity limits applied to projects meeting code requirements, with higher height and intensity limits applying to projects that provide public benefits beyond the code benefits. So I'm going to start with Measure R, and then I'll talk about Measure Y, and then we'll do a Q&A after both of them. So Measure R it was put onto the ballot by the San Mateo City Council, and if it's, if it's approved, it will ex extend the deadline to de December 31st, 2030. And this would, um, this would prohibit the City Council from increasing the heights and densities above Measure P limits in most of the city without voter approval. It would allow the City Council to amend the general plan to permit heights and densities that will exceed the limits established in Measure P in specified areas near the downtown Hayward Park and Hillsdale Caltrain stations without voter approval. This measure would also maintain the Measure P inclusionary housing requirement, but it would amend the general plan to allow alternative means of compliance that might include in lieu fees, land dedication, off-site construction, or acquisition and rehabilitation of existing units. This measure would also allow mixed use or residential projects that comply with the city's inclusionary housing policy to be developed at higher height and building intensity limits allowed in the areas with tiered limits without providing additional public benefits. So the arguments for Measure R include the fact that this was put on by a unanimous vote by our city council, and it would create new affordable housing opportunities near the three San Mateo train stations. Measure R keeps the height limits in our single family neighborhoods in San Mateo. And it also continues to make sure that we're, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, now our arguments against Measure R is that this is a developer's dream. It's it's a blank check and it removes the voter control of the height limit protections that are found in Measure P. It also hinders the production of our urgently needed affordable housing. And more importantly, it undermines the general plan. Now I'm gonna go on now and talk about Measure Y and then we'll have a Q&A on, on both. So all of the preliminary information still applies with Measure Y. And so Measure Y, if it was approved, would also extend the, the expiration of Measure P to December 31, 2030. It would also amend uh, Measure P concerning the inclusionary housing program to allow off-site construction of units or other, uh, or other means or, of compliance with the inclusionary housing requirement. This measure would not permit the payment of in lieu fees as an alternative means of compliance. It would also uh, prohibit the city council from modifying the inclusionary housing program without going back to the voters. And if it's, if it's passed, this will take effect 10 days after the election results are final. So the arguments for Measure Y is that this will protect our residential neighborhoods, it will keep our general plan intact, and it will still require a minimum of 10% affordable housing. Now the opponents argue that Measure Y doesn't provide any solution for creating affordable housing, it's not helping to fund essential city services, and it restricts our ability to address traffic and climate change. Now I'd like to stop here, and Nicole, are there any questions? Thanks, Susie. We actually don't have any questions for R and Y. So um, we, okay. have some, we have some questions anticipating other uh, propositions that we're gonna talk about, but I think we can move ahead. Okay, great. All right. So we're gonna move on now to measure RR. This is a tri-county local ballot measure. Um, 
and it was placed on the ballot by the legislature and is entitled Peninsula Quarter Joint Powers Board Caltrain Sales Tax Measure. Because Measure RR is asking for increased taxes, it requires a two-thirds majority of all votes in all three counties to pass. So here is the current situation. 70% of Caltrain funding comes from fares. Caltrain is the only passenger rail service in the country that relies on voluntary contributions from each of the three counties it passes through. County contributions total about $30 million. Additional contributions for Caltrain come from member agencies like the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority, the VTA, San Mateo County Transit District, SAMTRANS, and the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Authority, MUNI. Due to COVID-19, ridership is now down 95%. Caltrain is only being kept alive because of the temporary CARES Act, but there is no funding to continue the electrification program. So what does Measure RR propose to do? It authorizes a sales tax of 0.125%, one eighth of a cent, in the counties of Santa Clara, San Mateo, and the city and county of San Francisco for a period of 30 years. Because this is a tax measure, again, that has to have a two thirds majority of the voters in all three counties to pass. With this new, it's estimated that this tax would raise $108 million a year. And with this new tax, a dedicated source of revenue would, will be attained to fund the operating and capital expenses of the Caltrain rail service and for no other purposes. This allows Caltrain to increase peak and off-peak service and would provide subsidies that would make train service accessible to riders of all income levels. The Joint Powers Board will develop guidelines for and will administer the collected funds for the purposes intended. So the fiscal impact of Measure RR is as follows. It makes a step towards Caltrain being self-sustaining with no impact locally besides sales tax. The revenue collected will cover the annual $30 million in contributions from the three counties for operations funding and provide roughly 60 to $70 million per year to fund the systems aging on the systems the aging system's ongoing maintenance needs and to build new infrastructure that will greatly increase the capacity and efficiency of services. The sales tax of one eighth cent is applied to purchases that are usually taxed and to taxed uses. And you can see in the, in the graph comparing the current taxes and the proposal. So supporters say that most importantly, this tax will save Caltrain from seizing operations. Furthermore, it will improve the system with more trains and better connections with BART. It will continue to keep about 65,000 ca cars off the road. There will be strict fiscal accountability. Now, opponents say that pension and personnel costs have made Caltrain budgets difficult to meet. As always, it should be remembered that sales taxes are regressive and hurt the poorest communities most. Furthermore, Caltrain serves affluent riders whose fares should not be subsidized. Are there any questions on Measure RR? There are a couple. Um, so which three counties, but I think, I think that was on the, your last slide, but maybe you could just state them again. And then also, um, so this, go ahead. Um, the three counties are Santa Clara County, San Mateo County, and the city and county of San Francisco. And then are all the cities in the joint agency up to date on contributions? I'm going to say I think the answer is no. Um, I believe there are some open issues with Santa Clara and San Francisco not having paid their portions. Um, but I'm gonna say that's my guess. I'm not going to, I'm not positive on that. Okay. Uh, does R eliminate the VTA 
SAMTRANS and MTA contributions as well, or only the three county contributions? It is my understanding that the sales tax replaces all of the county and agency pieces. Okay. So that Caltrain would then be funded by the sales tax and the fares that will still be continuing to come in. Okay, two more questions. I'm gonna combine them. Would ticket prices be affected if measure RR is passed and how would the measure make it more affordable for riders? Um, so part of the, uh, our, the um, statement here is that they are hoping to provide subsidies that would be, a f be there for people of all income levels. So, and I think it would be income based. That's my understanding. Okay, and then is there anything that indicates what constitutes low income? I, I do not have that information. I would assume it would be the same type of uh, structure that the cities and counties already use today, except for example, with housing. And there are already, um, within the transportation area, there are already um, subsidies for uh, low income people. Okay. So they would, this would probably continue that. Um, so I guess last, last Two questions, since we skipped earlier, maybe we can just do a couple more. Will um, RR actually provide subsidies for fluent riders or will there be a tiered system? So similar to the previous questions. Um, um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know specifically about that. My understanding of what, what is said here is that the subsidies will be for low income riders it would not cover all riders. Okay. And then last question on this one. Does this tax help with the electrification of Caltrain? Yes. So that is one of the things that it was discussing. It would provide approximately 60 to $70 million a year to work on the ongoing maintenance needs. That includes the priority right now is the electrification project. Thank you. Are we ready to go to the next one? Yes, please. All right. We're going to go on to the state ballot propositions, and we're going to start with the two uh, ballot initiatives that are referring to uh, property tax and starting with Proposition 15. And this requires commercial and industrial real property to be taxed based on current market value instead of purchase price. It is expected to increase funding sources for K through 12 public schools, community colleges, and local governments in California. Now a little background. In the 1970s, property values were increasing rapidly each year. Taxation of property was then based on its current market value. Each local government entity, the city, school district, and the fire district, levied its own percentage tax on this value. In this period of rapid inflation, individual property tax bills increased rapidly. Owners, especially retired owners on fixed incomes, were looking for a way to protect themselves from escalating unaffordable property taxes. Proposition 13 was passed in 1978. It limited the taxation value of properties to their acquisition value plus an annual inflation factor, no greater than 2% a year. Since property values have increased faster than 2% <clears throat> for most of the past 40 years, long-term property holders pay significantly less than recent buyers for equivalent properties. Statewide, Educational entities receive about 40% of all property tax pay. 60% goes to cities, special districts, county governments, and ongoing redevelopment debt obligations. Here in San Mateo County, a higher percentage, over 60%, is allocated to education 
and a smaller percent, almost 40 percent, is allocated to cities and other local governments. Statewide, about $65 billion is collected in property tax statewide. Of that, about one-fifth, 21 percent, is collected on 600,000 commercial industrial properties. Currently, about $800 million is spent statewide administering the $65 billion in property tax assessments and collection. So let me point out that what Prop Proposition 15, it does not affect residential property. It would separate commercial industrial properties from all other properties. It would change their taxation basis and assessment regulations. Single family residents and apartments would not be affected, nor would small commercial property owners or agricultural land. Starting in t January 2022, commercial and industrial properties would be taxed on their current market value with reassessment to market at least every three years. Reassessment of certain small business occupied properties would be delayed until 2025. All business in California would also get a new tax break. They would be able to exempt up to $500,000 of equipment and fixtures from the separate 1% business personal property tax. Certain small businesses could exempt more. So where will the new revenues go? Well, they will go into, they will, the money revenue generated by reassessing commercial commercial industrial properties up to market value, including all future growth in commercial industrial property valuation would be allocated as follows. Any new revenue allocated to an educational entity would go into a new statewide educational fund. Note that every county is different. Some allocate more for education, others less. In San Mateo, over 62% of new revenues will be allocated to the new state fund once all redevelopment obligations have been met. Statewide, this contribution is estimated at 40%. The remainder within each county would be redistributed to local government entities based on their existing allocations. On average, this is 60% statewide, but varies greatly. Money coming out of the statewide educational fund would be allocated primarily based on headcount. However, schools whose local property tax exceeds the state's funding formula will receive less, through a, though a minimum of $100 per student. Many districts in San Mateo have recently become property tax funded districts due to property tax increases. Those that just qualify will receive somewhat more than $100 per student. Right now, for example, that would include Cabrillo, Redwood City, and Jefferson High. Overall, however, San Mateo County educational institutions will receive less than schools and community colleges elsewhere. So a full, at full implementation in 2025, the Legislative Analyst Office estimates between $6.5 and $11.5 billion of net revenue from this measure. 40% would go to education and would represent roughly a 4 to 7% supplement to the basic funding formula for state-funded schools. $100 would represent roughly a 1.2% supplement for our property tax-funded schools. The LAO also emphasized that the value of commercial property can change a lot from year to year, so this revenue could also change a lot from year to year. Not all entities would be guaranteed new money. The LAO indicates that rural areas may end up losing money. Also note that this could be a mixed bag, especially for basic aid districts. $100 per student of new revenue but a potentially offsetting loss of existing business personal property taxes, as well as lost growth in their commercial industrial property tax. So supporters say that Prop 15 will provide billions in new revenue for our communities and schools, and 10% of the wealthiest businesses will provide more than 90% of this money. 
This will also give tax breaks to small businesses to help our economy grow and keeps the Prop 13 protections for homeowners, renters, and farms. Now, the opponents say that Prop 15 would trigger the largest property tax increase in our history, and the additional costs will ultimately raise prices for, cus for consumers. Prop 15 will make it harder for people to start their business, and there will be huge costs to administer the program. Now, next we're going to talk about the financial side of this. So there is a lot of money in the support and opposition of Prop 15. So we have currently you know, 36.4 million. This was um, probably two or three weeks ago. So it is insuredly more than that. And in opposition, we've got 21 million. So there's a lot of money looking at this campaign. So very strong feelings going on. And that's, I'm ready to break at Prop 15 or we can continue with Prop 19, which is also property tax related. We have several questions. Um, one, so several questions asking how this, how 15 impacts Prop 13. Does it lead to the repeal of Prop 13? It, it what this is doing is it's modifying part of Proposition 13. Proposition 13, it entailed residential property tax and commercial property tax. It also had a number of other items that you may not be aware of. Residential property tax is not changing at all. This Prop 15 is only commercial property. And there, there are a number of, of safeguards looking for small businesses. Um, and protections on that. This is going after companies like Disney. Disney has been paying the same small property tax on Disneyland and the, all of their other properties since 1978. So, but we know their property has gone up vastly in, in value. That is what the kind of person, the kind of entity that this is addressed to. Okay, um, how about residential homes that small business operate out of? Oh, that's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that. But if, it's my understanding this is only, yeah, that is my understanding this only impacts <clears throat> property that is used for a commercial basis. So if this is also a residence, it should not apply. Um, but that's a very good question and I might have to go look that up. So related question, uh, how is small commercial business property defined? Okay, so the, the uh, rate that they have set here for the small businesses that will have an extra three years it's looking at a, I believe it's a property with a value of $3 million. Um, so if the property is small, now this is in San Mateo, our local property values may not meet these requirements. Um, but this is to look, remember again, this is looking statewide. So it's looking for a small business where the property has a value of, of three million or less. Okay. So several questions about the impact on San Mateo County schools. Um, and uh, would a community with less commercial property um, be, uh, have an outsized impact? And would tax increases go to poorer counties, noting that San Mateo County is very wealthy, relatively. Yes, so that, that was the discussion talking about um, the school funding. And most of, this, most of the school districts in San Mateo County receive the minimal, the minimum payment from the state. And so, so all of the money from these property taxes 
I believe this is going into a state fund. It's not going to be, and then the state will give back so much to the counties um, and out so much to the school districts. So the, again, we're looking at in San Mateo County, because most of our schools receive the minimum from the state for funding, we won't see very much. We'll see a small increase. And hopefully, though, we're looking at some of our smaller districts that will receive greater funding for their local schools. Um, however, there was a note from the legislative analyst that this could impact rural areas negatively because it could, um, because the, the value of the commercial property in their areas might go down. So there is a, there is a plus and minus impact across the board. Thank you. Are we ready to go on to Prop 19? Yes. All right. Okay, so Proposition 19 <clears throat> is also a, a constitutional amendment that was put on the ballot by the legislature. It stands in place of an initiative that had been qualified earlier by voter signatures by the California Realtors Association. The legislative version received support from more, most Democrats as well as some Republicans in both houses. Proposition 19 addresses the ability for qualified homeowners to transfer a low property tax valuation to a new primary residence. It also addresses the right of children to inherit a low property tax valuation on a parent's property re primary residence, as well as on income properties, including farms. So today, California's existing property tax assessment system is based on the property owner's original acquisition cost plus the limited 2% increase per year. So properties that are held for a long period typically have a significantly lower property tax than their similar neighbors that were acquired more recently. Proposition 60 in 1986 and Proposition 90 in 1998 created existing laws that allow certain homeowners to take one time their existing lower property tax basis with them when they move to a new home. Specifically, <clears throat> homeowners who are 55 or older, disabled, or who have been affected by natural disasters like earthquakes or wildfires can transfer their existing low valuation to a new primary residence that is of equal or lesser market value than their old home. However, statewide, they can only do it within their existing home county or to 10 other counties that allow incoming transfers. This includes San Mateo, Los Angeles, Orange, Santa, Santa Clara, Alameda, and San Diego counties. Meanwhile, Proposition 58 in 1986 created an, at a law that allows parents to transfer their current low property tax basis to children when the parents transfer a principal residence. This also applies to other pr real property, both residential and commercial, with a combined current assessment value, not market value, of less than one million. And in 2017, the Legislative Analyst Office estimated that about 5% of all property transfers in the state, primarily single family homes, had received this exclusion over the past decade. So Proposition 19 would extend the ability to keep a lower existing property tax basis when a qualified homeowner moves. Instead of requiring the new home's value to be less than the existing home, it can be more expensive. The property tax basis increases proportionally, though only on the excess market value between the two homes. The proposition also extends the ability to move to any county in the state for all qualified homeowners. And instead of just one transfer, three are allowed to those homeowners 55 and over or disabled. At the same time, Prop 19 narrows the ability of parents to transfer a low property tax basis to children 
except in the case of primary residence. Only for a parent's primary residence can the existing property tax basis be transferred to a child. That child must make it their primary residence within one year, qualifying for a homeowner's exemption. And only the first million dollars of difference between tax valuation and market value is excluded. Proposition 19 also adds family farms to the properties eligible for family transfer or inheritance with, with their existing property tax valuation. Finally, Prop 19 provides for any net savings to the state as a result of these changes to flow to a statewide fire response fund. <clears throat> so the proposition creates a number of changes in property tax revenues, and generally these counterbalance financially. Um, over time, the Legislative Analyst Office expects up to hundreds of millions a year in increased property tax revenue to flow to city and county governments. Any decrease in property tax receipts as a result of the greater portability for qualified homeowners will be offset by higher property tax payments, particularly on inherited properties. The LAO also expects higher property taxes for schools and community colleges in areas such as ours where many districts are funded by property tax rather than state aid. Finally, the LAO expects that the additional property tax generated in state aid funded school districts will lower the state's funding requirements in some years. Any reduction will flow into a fund to improve fire protection and response by both state and local fire agencies. So supporters say that this would create some flexibility for seniors, the disabled, and disaster victims. It creates home ownership opportunities for new people statewide, and it eliminates the unfair tax advantage of heirs of property owners, and it increases the funding for firefighters, schools, and emergency response. Now, opponents say that this is just a ma massive tax increase. It increases competition for small starter homes and takes away the inheritance rights of children provided by Prop 55. Now, this is another proposition that also has quite a bit of money, but it's all one-sided. This is all on the supporters side. We have 35.7 million and probably more. Um, now in opposition, very little money, but there is editorial opposition by, uh, by many newspapers. Any questions on Proposition 19? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, okay. I think we're good to move on to, to the next one. Okay. All right. We're going to move on to Proposition 21. And again, we've, we're still in kind of this general, general area of housing, property tax, et cetera. <clears throat> Proposition 21 seeks to expand the authority of local governments to enact rent control on residential property. And this ballot measure was derived from a voter petition and is con considered an initiative statute. So co the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act limits application of local housing rental laws to the following. It's single family homes, housing built after 1995, and allows rent increases without limit when a, when a renter first moves in. While the ability of city governments is limited by state and federal constitutions and laws, Costa Hawkins increased these regulations. On the November 2018 ballot, Prop 10 would have repealed Costa Hawkins. However, it was defeated. We know that rental housing is very expensive in California and the supply is limited. So unlike single family homes, rental prices did not decrease during the 2008 recession. And it's not clear yet what will happen as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. The cities of San Francisco, San Jose, and Los Angeles do have rent control laws, but even these cities are experiencing an increase in the number of units rented at current market rates when a new tenant moves in. This is allowed under Costa Hawkins when a tenant vacates a unit. In addition, court rulings allow landlords to receive profits each year, and this is known as a fair rate of return. So let's look at what Prop 21 intends to do if approved. 
It would modify Costa Hawkins law so that counties and cities may, if they wish to, place rent control on homes that are more than 15 years old, that is, built in 2004 or earlier. Landlords who own or rent three or more single-family homes may have rent control issues. However, landlords owning only one or two rental homes will be exempt. Rent control will be applied to new tenant rental prices, but does not allow a 15% increase over three years to that new lease. Thus, the court mandate of keeping a fair rate of return for landlords is honored. And again, Prop 21 amends Costa Hawkins rather than getting rid of it. Rent control would be allowed to apply to all properties more than 15 years old, as opposed to the, to the pre-1995 properties. Costa Hawkins excludes rent control for single family homes. With Prop 21, rent control can be applied if the property owner has more than two single family homes used as rental properties. And under t Prop 21, rent control could also limit the increases in rental rates at after a unit is vacated. So here is the analysis from the Legislative Analyst Office. Overall, the measure would, would likely would reduce state and local revenues over time, with the largest effect being on property taxes <coughs> if landlords sell their rental units at a lower value. However, it is difficult to predict fiscal impact because of the number of factors in play, such as the extent to which cities and counties will change their rental laws or whether landlords keep their properties or sell them to live-in owners. Other consequences may occur, such as the value of rental properties may decline, reducing property taxes collected. Landlords may also postpone or ignore property maintenance to reduce their costs. If some renters will be paying less, landlords will re receive less income, thus reducing state income taxes collected. And some renters may choose to stay in a rent control department rather than move out, even if they could afford to pay more. So the supporters say that Prop 21 will save taxpayers money by reducing homelessness. It will have the consequences of keeping rental housing costs down, bringing stability to seniors, families, and veterans. Further, communities are diverse and capable of deciding whether their situation warrants rent controls. Even with Prop 21, landlords are guaranteed a reasonable profit. Prop 21 is supported by a broad coalition of elected officials, labor unions, civic organizations, national social justice groups, etc. Now, the opponents of Prop 21 argue that it will not address the housing shortage, will not reduce rents, and therefore provides no protections for seniors, families, and veterans. Further, Prop 21 takes away basic protections for homeowners, treating them like corporate landlords. Now, this is a ballot initiative that has quite a bit of money in opposition. While there's 16 million in support, there's 47 million going against it. So you can see that there's an, a number of, of entities and primarily real estate um, and, and entities that are in opposition. Are there any questions on Proposition 21? Uh, yes, we have a couple. Who determines okay. a, a fair rate of return and how? So the court, oh, I saw that here. Where did I see it? I saw it in my notes. Where did I? You know, I don't have a figure. Um, the proposal is that it would allow a 15% increase over three years and that that was considered a fair rate of return. Okay, uh, next question. What, yes. prop, what proposition does Prop 21 amend? Um, it does not, I don't think, I think Costa Hawkins was a legislative okay. action. So, 
um, it's not it's not revising, it's not modifying um, a prior initiative, it's modifying an existing law. Okay. Um, another question, what existing protections are there for seniors, veterans, etc.? Um, unless you live in a city that has rent control, there really aren't any. Okay. Um, and I think just one more question. Um, it's a little complicated. What if a property owner owns one single family home, one townhouse that has two units and one condo? Only the single family home is not rented out. Would this impact the property owner? I'm, I'm going to say I believe so because it's talking, the limit is one or two rental homes. And I'm, I would assume that the, when it says home, that, <clears throat> that could be a single family unit or a condo, um, that those would both qualify. So if, there's, if you have more than two, then you would be impacted by this. Okay. Or the potential, because again, remember this is simply to allow cities and counties to put their own rent control ordinances um, to their communities. This is not the state putting the, the rent control out there. It is simply allowing communities to do it. Today, the communities are unable to do that because Costa Hawkins prohibits it. Okay. Um, does, does this proposition discourage people from owning more than two houses as an investment? Well, if they're, if, if they're using them as rental income, um, two is fine, but if you have three, then you would be eligible for the rent control if your community implements it. Okay. okay that's it. I think we can move on to, I think. Okay. All okay. right. So our next one, now we're getting into some of the, what I consider under the umbrella of criminal justice, is Proposition 17, and this restores the right to vote after the completion of a prison term. And this is a legislative constitutional amendment. So today, in 1974, Proposition 10 was approved, which amended the California Constitution to disqualify people from voting until their state imprisonment and state parole are completed. California is one of only three states that require persons to complete both their prison and parole terms before they're allowed to vote. 19 states allow persons on parole to vote. So Proposition 17 would amend the California Constitution to allow persons who have completed their state prison term and are on parole to vote. This would potentially affect 49,000 parolees. So persons in state and federal prisons would continue to be restricted from voting. The, <clears throat> there would be some increased cost, county costs, likely in the hundreds of thousands of dollars statewide for voter registration and ballot materials. There also would be a one-time state cost, likely in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to update voter registration cards and systems. So the, the, the uh, supporters say that people who have completed their prison terms pay taxes at the local, state, and federal levels, they should have a voice in government. Restoring their rights to vote while under parole is a way to encourage people to re-enter society and have a stake in their community. And civic engagement is connected to lower rates of recidivism. Now opponents say that in California, parole is a legal part of the prison term and people must successfully complete parole, usually three years, in order to have completed their sentence, at which time their voting rights would be restored. About half of parolees also commit additional felonies. 
And recently, prison reform measures have moved nonviolent felons into county jails. And while in the county jails, they have the right to vote while serving their sentence. And a quick look at, at the financial support. Um, this is not a big money, big money issue. There's only half a million or so in, in support, and the opponents have no contributions at all. Now, any questions on Proposition 17? Sorry about that. Um, let's see. We <laughs> no problem. have, um, let's see, what is the proposed change to those deemed mentally ill or incompetent who were mentioned in the first slide? I'm going to come back to the first slide. Ah, <clears throat> so in so the that this is simply talking about the rules in California today, and California law states that voters who have been declared mentally incompetent, or imprisoned, or on parole for a felony are ineligible to vote. Um, this is addressing the imprisoned and parole, and particularly just the parole side of that. So people that are, and being declared mentally incompetent, it means that you have gone in front of a judge and been declared incompetent. It is not something that is easily done. Okay. Uh, we have a question that asks why the legislature um, didn't pass this. Why has it come before the voters? Well, that's a good question. Um, I will say that the California legislature this last session did much less work than they do in a, in a regular year. Um, the legislature was on hold for about half of their session due to COVID-19. Um, and I, that's, it's a very good question why the legislature didn't do it. I don't have an answer for that. Okay. I think that's it. Any other questions? Okay. All right. We're gonna move on to Proposition 20. Proposition 20 deals with criminal justice. It would, <clears throat> it would place some new sentence reductions. It would place new limits on the sentence reductions that were enacted a few years ago. It would allow some theft-related crimes to be charged as felonies, and it would create two new crimes, serial theft and organized retail theft. Both crimes would result in jail time. So the way it is now is due to a 2011 U.S. Supreme Court ruling stating that overcrowding in California prisons resulted in cruel and unusual punishment and therefore ordered a reduction in the prison population. Assembly Bill 109, Prop 47, which voters approved in 2017, and finally Prop 57 were all passed in an effort to provide find a safe, effective way to reduce prison overcrowding. Currently, theft crimes can be charged as misdemeanors if the amount is less than $950. That's Prop 47. Right now, parole and post-release community supervision practices for released prisoners of violent crimes allow parole breakers to be returned to jail. Prop 57, which passed four years ago, offered a chance of parole to some serving prison sentences for crimes that don't fall on the state's list of violent crimes. These inmates would be considered for release after serving their, the term for their primary crime. So Prop 20, it would change the penalties for serial theft and organized crime theft with a value of more than $250. Some felony charges apply here. It then creates a list of criteria 
for the Board of Parole hearings to use in considering whether to grant parole to an inmate convicted of a nonviolent crime. For example, a judge must change the terms of supervision if parole is broken three times. Also, it would allow prosecutors to review information about the inmate and review the board's decision, and it would allow victims' families to participate in parole review. <clears throat> Prop 20 would also change release categories from Prop 57, expanding the list of violent crimes for which there is no early release. This would include sex trafficking of a child and felony domestic violence. And it would, it would expand DNA testing to require samples be taken from some people convicted of theft, such as shoplifting, also check forgery and domestic violence. And importantly, it would require three quarters majority in both houses of the state legislature to amend the law should Prop 20 pass. So precise costs are difficult to estimate. Depending on which aspects of Proposition 20 are implemented, costs could amount to less than 1% of the state's annual budget. But because it could result in an increase in the prison population and change the way post-release supervision is handled, Prop 20 would increase state and local costs by tens of millions of dollars annually. So our supporters say, that it would prevent the early release of violent offenders and sexual predators by making 28 additional crimes violent, according to the Penal Code, bringing the total to 51 crimes listed as violent in the Penal Code. It would also require that victims be notified when their assailants are set free. Those in favor of add that Prop 20 would not uh, would not add to the prison population, it would simply prevent certain inmates convicted of violent crimes from being released early. And opponents say that this proposition, if passed, would roll back the prison reforms and cost taxpayers millions of dollars annually. It would also slash prison mental health and rehab programs, and it would result in extreme sentences for petty theft impacting vulnerable minorities. Opponents call Prop 20 a prison spending scam at a time when we're actively closing prisons and reallocating funds toward what's new needed in a community. Also, opponents say that the system is already profoundly biased against minorities, and this would return California to the era of mass incarceration. So there is a moderate amount of money in support and opposition on this bill, um, and there's Around four million in favor and two and a half in opposition. Um, in comparison with some of the bills we've looked at, this is, this is pretty modest spending. Any questions on Proposition 20? Just one question. What qualifies as serial theft? Ah, <clears throat> I believe that that is looking at um, things like car break-ins and uh, what's the other one that's a low, very, it's a, and the car break-in is the one I keep thinking of because the people that are, that are held for it are right back out and they're on the street and then they're arrested again a week later. And I think this is an attempt, this is my belief, that this is an attempt to try and add that crime so that there will actually be um, something done about it, that you will actually be held accountable for the car break-ins and, and other crimes like that. It's also the thefts from stores where people go in, grab handfuls, and run out the door. There is typically very little uh, punishment for, for those kinds of theft. That was the only question for Prop 20. Okay, all right. We're gonna go on to Proposition 25. <clears throat> and this is a referendum on a law that placed cash bail with a system based on public safety and flight risk. This is a special kind of ballot measure because we're asking voters whether to approve or reject a law passed by the legislature. 
In this case, it's the fate of a 2018 law about abolishing cash bail in California. Companies and political action committees representing the bail industry quickly gathered signatures for this referendum after SB 10 was signed into law. As a result, SB 10 has been on hold and is awaiting a final decision by voters. The state constitution currently mandates that people arrested and sent to county jail have the right to release before trial, except those charged with certain felony crimes. They may be released under their own recognizance when risk is low. They can be released by paying bail. Two years ago, Senate Bill 10 was passed calling for the elimination of cash bail and changing the process for release from, from jail before trial. The day after Governor Jerry Brown signed SB 10, this veto referendum, Prop 25, was filed to overturn the bill. Now, this referendum recites SB 10 in its entirety and Prop 25 in the form of a citizen initiative measure asks, users, asks voters to approve SB 10. On the one hand, you have a law set to be enacted two years ago in the state legislature. On the other hand, you have a bail bonds companies who put this referendum on the ballot, hoping it would be defeated in order to protect the cash bail system and their industry. So Prop 25 would eliminate release from county jail on bail. It would eliminate the release of most misdemeanor prisoners after 12 hours in jail. So instead of cash bail, SB 10 calls for a risk assessment to determine which people charged with felonies and some misdemeanors that if they can be safely released. Those considered high risk, those charged with violent crimes such as murder and arson, would be detained in jail until arraignment. State trial courts would be responsible for performing the risk assessments. So there would be an increased state and local pretrial costs in the mid hundreds of millions of dollars annually. However, this would be balanced by decreased county jail costs. And competing effects on state and local taxes, the total impact, however, is unknown. But there would be a loss of taxes on bail bond fees. On the other hand, there would be increased spending by those released who do not have to pay bail bonds. So supporters say that that the bail money is unfair, it's dangerous, and it's costly. And bail favors the rich who can afford to buy their freedom while they await trial, while those without wealth must stay in jail because they don't have the means to pay cash bail. Under this system, supporters of Prop 25 say dangerous criminals can be back on the street once they're out on bail. And those jailed for misdemeanors would be released right away, decreasing the county jail population. Now opponents say, and these are the ones who put Prop 25 on the ballot, they're hoping that it'll be defeated and therefore eliminating SB 10. They do, however, agree with supporters also calling Prop 25 unfair, dangerous, and costly, but for different reasons. They argue that it eliminates the right to bail that a risk assessment program is actually a computer-based algorithm which can lead to profiling and could be biased against minorities and the poor. It would be very costly, calling for the creation of a new bureaucratic network within the state court system. Now, there's a, a, a fair amount of money in this ballot proposition, um, $8 million in support and $5 million in opposition. Um, modest though in comparison with some of the bills we've looked at. Are there any questions? Yes, several. Um, one, the first is how is risk assessed? Um, and I think you mentioned uh, there's an algorithm. So is it by computer algorithm? So, so that is open for this discussion to my knowledge. Um, I will tell you that Santa Clara County has a no bail, no cash bail policy. 
and they use a combination <clears throat> of a computer assess assessment that looks at um, do you have a job, you know, or do you have a place to live, are you, you know, are you a stable person that you are liable to come back. Um, but it also then takes the um, the and I'm trying to remember it's the probation department does a report. And so it is not straightforward that it is just going to be a computer model that would do this. It is typically a combination of the probation department report and this model giving a value and then going to the judge to make a determination. So there is no one set model in SB 10. And this would be each county would be developing their own. And I know from, from discussions on this topic with our, our district attorney in San Mateo County, San Mateo County is already looking at this. So this would do it statewide. Well, there are several questions, I think, kind of getting at some confusion with this one. Um, I'll just read yes. the three, of, so there's three. Explain the difference between a yes vote and a no vote. Do supporters or opponents vote yes? And if you want to eliminate reduced cash bail, do you vote for this proposition? All right, so a vote yes on Prop 25 would allow SP 10 to take effect, and this would eliminate cash bail in California. A no vote on Prop 25 would overturn SB 10 and eliminate that from the law. It would continue our current cash bail system. Okay. Would, uh, oh, are domestic violence and sexual crimes in the excluded category? I can't answer that. I don't know exactly. There, there are specific categories that are considered violent, um, and that likely would be, con be one of them. But no, I do not know for, for sure. And then a final question, does Prop 25 contribute to the mass incarceration of people of color? There was a similar question for um, 17 about disproportionate number uh, impacts on people of color. So one of the reasons that supporters like SB 10 to eliminate the cash bail system is that our county jails are filled with people waiting for court. These are people that cannot afford to pay bail. And so this system, and, and keep in mind, most of those people are poor. Most are of people of color. Um, these are the, the workers of our community. And they, instead, they sit in jail and lose their job, possibly lose their place to live, et cetera. So that is one of the, the supporters main reasons that S SB 10 needs to be enacted is that most of those people would be put out um, on their own recognizance. There would not be, they would not be kept in jail simply because they could not afford to pay bail. So yes, there is a, a very legitimate um, look at minorities and the poor. Last question. Um, yes. Since it's a referendum, does Prop 25 require two thirds majority? No, no. The only measure on your ballot that requires anything more than a majority is the prop R, uh, the measure RR in our county because that's a tax. All of the state ballot propositions require a simple majority to pass. 
That was the final question. All right. Are we ready? Okay. Okay. All right. And now we'll head on to Proposition 22. And Proposition 22 would allow app-based drivers, like people who drive for Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash, to be treated as independent contractors. It does outline some additional benefits for drivers, but it exempts the app companies from having to provide benefits employees in California are entitled to. So let's start with the way it is now. Back in 2019, the California State Legislature passed Assembly Bill 5, which imposes strict requirements on those who could be classified as an independent contract worker instead of an employee. This law impacts most employers in the state with a few specific exemption, exceptions. But it made the news because this would mean that app companies like Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash would have to qualify, classify their drivers as employees and provide them with benefits like minimum wage, sick leave, unemployment benefits, and workers' compensation. Since the passage of AB5, app companies have continued to treat their drivers as independent contractors and are currently being sued by the state of California. So the app companies have put forward Proposition 22 to try to settle the matter in their favor. Before we go into what Prop 22 would do, I want to note that AB5 affects all industries in California, but Prop 22 would only apply to app-based transportation and delivery drivers. Essentially, if Prop 22 passes, it would mean that AB5 does not apply to app-based drivers. The drivers would be considered independent contractors and given some benefits, but not everything that the law requires today. The chart here gives some of the benefits, but not every the chart here shows how Prop 22 proposes to treat the drivers and how it differs from AB5. So first, AB5 requires drivers to be paid at least minimum wage, earn overtime, and have some expenses reimbursed. Prop 22 would guarantee 120% minimum wage and some mileage reimbursement. But it's important to know that the wage calculations here are slightly different because the minimum wage under AB5 includes the time drivers are logged into the app and waiting for passengers. The Prop 22's wage calculation would only apply to active driving time. And aside from pay, healthcare is a major concern for workers. AB5 would require app companies to provide an employer healthcare option. Prop 22 would reimburse drivers who work 15 to 24 hours per week for 50% of a covered California bronze health plan. And drivers who work 25 hours or more per week would get 100% of a bronze tier health plan. So AB5 requires that employer, employees are offered workers' compensation when they are injured on the job. They're paid family leave, they have paid sick days, and unemployment insurance. In contrast, Prop 22 would not provide any of that, but it would provide accident insurance for drivers and implement anti-discrimination policies and driver training in things like accident avoidance and recognizing and reporting sexual assault or misconduct. Finally, AB5 allows for union rights with a state law change, but Prop 22 requires a seventh, eighth supermajority vote for drivers to unionize. So how will Prop 22 affect the state's finances? The predicted fiscal impact is that there will be a slight increase in income, pack, income taxes paid by rideshare drivers and investors who own stock in rideshare and delivery companies. The idea is that the app companies would be doing more business and seeing more profits because they did not have to provide the more expensive benefits required by AB5. This slight increase in income taxes assumes that the court in California would decide that the app companies need to treat drivers as employees if Prop 22 doesn't pass. I also want to point out that Uber's CEO and Lyft's president 
have said that the companies could suspend rideshare operations in California for a few months or a year if they have to comply with AB5. They did this in Austin, Texas. They shut down for a year after the city passed an ordinance requiring driver background checks. The service resumed when the Texas governor signed a law that preempted Austin's ordinance. The companies have also indicated that if they have to comply with AB5, they would not be able to have as many drivers as they do now. So supporters of Prop 25 um, say that this protects their choice of working as an independent contractor. That means they can work on other jobs and set their own hours. The supporters also claim that 22, Prop 22 improves the app-based work by requiring companies to provide some new benefits like healthcare subsidies and, and accident insurance. They also claim that Prop 22 has expanded public safety protections by implementing policies on anti-discrimination and sexual harassment and requiring criminal background checks for drivers. Now opponents say that Prop 22 creates a special exemption for app companies like Uber and Lyft that eliminates the basic workplace benefits and replaces them with a new lower earnings guarantee and healthcare subsidy. Remember, um, opponents also say that over 70% of the drivers work 30 or more hours per week, and the existing law wouldn't impede flexibility. This assumes that the app companies would be willing to allow employees to set their own hours if they have to provide paid time off and overtime pay. So there is an enormous amount of money in this campaign. And this $182 million, well, again, that was probably two or three weeks ago. So there might be even more. Um, and that is just on one ballot initiative. Now, opponents have a modest amount, um, $8.5 million, possibly $10 million now. Um, but the major m money is coming from our app-based uh, um, companies. And that is the end of, of Prop 22. Are there questions? We have several questions, um, but I also want to alert you, Susie, that we are at 823. Um, so, yes. Yes. Um, <clears throat> questions? Yes. And this is, I. so I went to the last few that I think are ones that people can look up um, pretty easily themselves. We have gotten through all the heavy hitters. Okay. Let's get to a couple questions on this one, and then we'll move quickly, try yeah. to move quickly to the rest. Um, under Prop 22, does the employer have to provide benefits for all employees or only those considered full-time? Um, I... And then I'll oh, add... Okay, so on Prop... Okay, so Prop 22 is only providing the health care benefit, and that is in a... 50% for a under 25 hours and 100%. And again, it's the value of a bronze plan on California, um, a covered California bronze health plan, okay. which is a modest health care plan. What so type there of is, and that's the, hmm? go ahead. I was just, I was going to move on to the next question, but please finish. Please. What types of industries are not covered under Prop 22? Um, so there are a lot of contract workers um, in California. Um, I will tell you, I used to be a contract worker. I worked for a software company. Um, under AB5, I am required to be an employee because of the, the kind of work that I do. Um, there are many exceptions, though, to AB5, and the state legislature has been working on those. Um, there was an exception made for musicians who often work at many different jobs and usually do um, one job at a time. Um, so that kind of work has been exempted. They're allowed to stay as a contract worker. And the, the 
main definition is who controls your workload. And if it is the company like Uber or Lyft saying, here are your jobs, that is what the state is saying um, makes these drivers employees, that they, are, they should be classified as an employee rather than an independent contractor. And an independent contractor today has no, you know, you have no overtime, you have no health care, you have no unemployment, et cetera. If the proposition passes, would rideshare companies be allowed to require minimum driving hours? That is not clear. Um, and I don't believe there is anything in AB5 or Prop 22 that, that discusses minimum hours. And then final question on this one, then we it move is, on. Um, I yes. think there's confusion here also about what a yes vote means and what a no vote means. So a yes vote is in support of the rideshare companies um, being allowed to keep having their drivers as independent contractors and they would offer some um, health care options and some um, minor benefits. A no vote would allow, a, would, would mean that AB5, the legislation that was passed requiring these rideshare companies to make these drivers employees would then be moving forward. And there is a court case determining that. Does that answer? I think so. It, it is a confusing. All right. Shall we go on really quick for, I've got, I still have a few more, but, but I, I really did this so that if I didn't get to the end, the ones at the end are much more easier, much easier to understand. All right. I'm going to go quickly into Prop uh, 16. This is discussing Prop 209 that was, that was put together in, in 1996. And this would allow, Prop 16 would allow diversity to be used as a factor in public employment, education, and contracting decisions. So in 1996, Prop 209 was passed, and this limited what state and local entities they were prohibited from using race and gender as a means to minimize the underutilization of women and people of color. And there are a few exceptions, and these are things where a job might be, for example, at a women's prison that you are hiring women guards. Um, so before Prop 209, state and local entities had policies and programs intended to increase opportunities for people who faced inequalities due to race, sex, color, or ethnicity. <clears throat> and Prop 209 was put in place so that public entities, um, they, <clears throat> they had to create or modify their policies and programs. And this includes things like universities um, going out and checking, you know, instead of using a policy looking at, at uh, race or ethnicity, they might be going out and doing um, an outreach program to those with, that would be the first in their family to attend college. So quickly, what Prop 16 would do would repeal Prop 209, and it would allow profession, pro, preferential treatment to individuals or groups on the basis of rex, safe, race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the decision-making policies in public employment, education, and contracting. So what it does not do is alter the state and federal laws guaranteeing equal protection and prohibiting unlawful discrimination. So there's really um, not a lot of fiscal impact on this. Um, and today, nearly all the public contracts and jobs go to the large companies anyway. Um, Sorry, I'm going to the next slide. <laughs> All right, so there really isn't a, a much of a Im fiscal impact on this. So supporters say that, this, that we all deserve the equal opportunity to thrive and succeed. And we need to expand access to good jobs and wages 
regardless of your gender, race, or ethnicity. And today, almost all of those public contracts and jobs are going to large companies run by old white guys. And small businesses, though, are the backbone of our economy, and we need to have the small Main Street businesses get a chance here. And they have lost over a billion dollars because of the current law. And by the way, quotas are still prohibited with Prop 16. Now, the opponents of Prop 16 say that California has successful men and women of all races and ethnicity, and that pop passing Prop 16 would continue the stereotype that women and minorities can't make it on their own and need special preferences to succeed. And this, the interpretation of underrepresented group can be misconstrued. And passing Prop 16 would encourage state and local entities to reinstitute costly bureaucracies and programs. Now, looking at the money here, there's not a great deal of money. There's 10 million in support. Um, however, there's 200,000 in opposition. So there's not, not a great deal of talk actually on Prop 16. Do you want me to continue just run through the last two? Yes, and we've had a special um, request that we please include the uh, Prop 23 uh, kidney dialysis. Can Can you say that one again? Uh, Prop 23. Can I include? Kidney dialysis. Ah, okay. All right. That is not that one. Ah, here we go. Okay. I'm going to come. And that was actually my. Okay. Prop 23. Here we go. Okay. So Proposition 23 would require kidney dialysis clinics to have a physician on premises while patients are being treated and require clinics to send quarterly reports on infections to the state agency. It would also require a state approval before a clinic could be closed. So kidney dialysis is a treatment that filters the blood for people whose kidneys can no longer function. And people uh, typically uh, need three treatments a week and each one lasting three hours. There are approximately 600 licensed clinics uh, operating in California, and they serve about 80,000 patients a month. Under federal rules, the patient's doctor must visit them during dialysis at least once a month. It's estimated that dialysis clinics have revenues exceeding $3 billion, and dialysis is often paid for by Medicare and Medi-Cal, along with private insurance. Now, you might remember Proposition 8 from 2018, which also tried to limit the profits of dialysis clinics that they're able to make. And it was one of the most expensive ballot propositions in California history and was voted down. Opponents, complained, um, opponents claimed that it was the union attempting to push the large uh, owners into dis from discouraging unionization, and they made similar claims about Prop 23. So what would Prop 23 do? The first thing is, is that the centers would have to have a licensed physician on site during all hours of operation unless there is a doctor shortage, in which case the clinic may operate with a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant on site. Next, they would have to report dialysis-related infe infection information to the California Department of Public Health every three months. And dialysis clinics would also have to notify the Department of Public Health and get consent if they plan on decreasing service or closing a dialysis location. And finally, Prop 23 would prohibit dialysis, cl dialysis clinics from refusing care to a patient based on who is paying for the patient's treatment. This is important because different types of insurance will pay different rates for dialysis treatment. Medicare and Medi-Cal generally pay less than private insurance. 
dialysis companies are currently fighting a law passed in 2019, AB 290, that would lower reimbursement rates for dialysis to Medicare levels and require health plans to accept premium payments from charities. The companies claim it's unconstitutional. It's another example of attempts to limit the profits of the dialysis centers. So it's estimated that Prop 23 would increase the costs for the clinical dialysis centers and the state. So, um, it would likely cost the dialysis clinics about $100,000 for each clinic to have an on-site physician. And if increased rates are negotiated with payers, it would also increase state costs by about $10 million a year. And the new oversight responsibilities of the Department of Health would cost something in the low millions per year. So supporters say that Prop 23 makes improvements to dialysis patient care by requiring a physician on premises and quarterly reporting of all infections. It prevents the arbitrary closure of clinics in rural areas by requiring state approval before a clinic can close. And it prevents the discrimination against patients by not allowing clinics to treat them differently because of how they are paying for the treatments. Now the opponents say that Prop 23 would increase costs and in force enclosures. Clinics would have to hire doctors to be on premises and would also need staff to manage quarterly reporting to the state. They assert that cl dialysis clinics are well regulated by the federal government and don't require additional oversight by the state. O opponents also claim that requiring a doctor to be on premises when the dialysis clinic is treating patients would adversely impact a, um, emergency room and hospital doctor shortages. The proposition does allow for yearly waivers to be issued by the state if a particular area is experiencing a doctor shortage. Um, so there is a modest amount in support of Prop 23, but again, we have a very large um, volume, 73 million plus in opposition to this. So again, we have a very well-funded opposition to a kidney dialysis uh, initiative. And I'm gonna say, are there questions? Um, two questions. How often must dialysis centers report infection rates currently and what kind of infection reporting or other key regulations do the feds have in place already for dialysis centers? Now, I don't know specifically what, what is required of the Fed, but this is a new requirement to report quarterly every three months to the state. So today, I believe they are only doing the reporting to the federal, um, to the feds. And that's the, those are the only questions for Prop 23. Mm -hmm. And we are 10 minutes okay. over. We are. <laughs> <laughs> and we actually, we did very well because um, we had Prop 24 um, and Prop 14 and Prop 18. So we, we made it through 12 of the 15. That is actually quite good. I think so. so and I'd like to thank everybody. Thank you. And I, I hope that you learned something. And remember, there's lots of places to get more information on the ballot measures. There's, um, there will be videos of the ballot presentations available on YouTube in the next few days. This is coming from the League of Women Voters of San Mateo County. Um, there will also be more uh, Zoom sessions um, I think, Nicole, you said there's another city. Um, there was a candidate forum in San Mateo that was videoed that if you want to, to go see, this is the city council race. Um, that is on the city website. Um, so there was a lot of information out there and, and I hope I gave you some good starts. We have another um, ProCon forum scheduled for October 17th. 10.30 a.m. that's a Saturday, um, also with the League of Women Voters of North and Central San Mateo County. And um, this 
um, today's session has been recorded and it will be on the library's YouTube channel. So we have an Cemetery County Library's YouTube channel. You're welcome to go there. Um, I did pop a link in the chat. Let me try it again. Um, we have a playlist on our channel called Voter Resources. Um, so this will be there. Um, we have some other um, voter re education related recordings there as well. And we'll add our October 17th uh, date to that um, uh, playlist as well. I wanna thank everybody for coming. It's amazing that it's um, it's almost 8.45 and we <laughs> still have 40 peop uh, 80 people um, on this. <laughs> I think we had two, over 200 registered. Um, makes me feel great that um, we are all taking this election seriously and our rights and responsibilities as um, voters seriously as well. Thank you for attending tonight. And thank you, Susie, it was wonderful. You're welcome. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.